next talk, Exposing Systems of Power and Injustice. Systems of Power and Injustice, they are everywhere, everywhere. everyone hates them. Um, these people have been doing handling with these systems for five years now. It's the Disruption Network Lab from Berlin, and they are an institution for arts, politics, whistleblowing, and uh, what was the last thing? I forgot. <laughs> Here to give the talk for you are uh, Tatjana and Lieke. So, and while I'm here, sorry, oh, just yes. a quick mention, the talk will also be available with subtitles by our great subtitle angels. Thank you very much. So, thank you very much. Uh, we are really happy to be here. My name is Tatiana Bazzichelli, and I'm the director of the Disruption Network Club. And with me there is... Uh, yeah, my name is Lieke Plucher, and I'm directing the community program of the Disruption Network Lab. Yes. So, uh, we want to uh, do, in a sense, a long presentation, but hopefully not too boring, yeah. <laughs> because uh, we really like to connect different dots in our activity. That is also why we usually try to describe what we do as an interconnection of different practices. Uh, we work uh, on the cultural aspect within uh, whistleblowing and culture, and uh, hacking and politics, and also we try to be really careful and uh, close to the discourse of uh, uh, social justice and the importance of the civil society. But we are a conference program in Berlin, so we usually try to invite people that uh, work on these subjects. Uh, but uh, at the same time, we also do a, a great work of preparation before each conference, and we want to present here a bit the genesis of our program and also what we have been doing in the past five years, even before. <laughs> so I'm actually starting um, with something that doesn't go on, of course. This oh, is uh, the great technology uh, aspects uh, that uh, everything works until the second time, the first time. Oh, yes, here we are. You know, this is always uh, the point when you do events, you go on stage, the technology doesn't work, but now we, here we are. So I go back to basically 19 years, <laughs> so it's not really five years ago, and I really like to bring this uh, image because uh, you know, in a sense, we are real also because we believe in certain practices and we believe also in the network that creates these practices. And here I was at the hack meeting uh, in Italy, in Rome, in 2000. That was my second hack meeting. I'm Italian, as you can imagine. Um, and it uh, was a really great situation in which back in the time, uh, a group of us uh, was uh, trying to create the connection between hacking and art. And at the same time, we also ask ourselves uh, if uh, hacking is political. And of course, there were a lot of interesting debates because not all the people uh, in the time really believed uh, on the connection of uh, art uh, and hacking uh, because, of course, art was always uh, confined uh, uh, in a specific systems. But uh, what we were trying to do, and this was our effort, was trying to open up this system, especially also the cultural system and the ones of art, and also demonstrate that uh, hacking can also be an attitude that brings you to interpret society and culture in a very different way. So this is what we were doing back in the time, at least a group of us, not all. Uh, we were at the Forte Prenestino in Rome doing this great event. And uh, then my first uh, international meeting was actually here uh, at the CCC, the Chaos Communication Camp 2003. Uh, that is also the year in which I moved uh, to Berlin. Uh, so we are both based in Berlin, and uh, uh, back in the time I had another kind of interesting discussion. Uh, the camp was much smaller than today, uh, and uh, you know, but it was also a very interesting time because it was really at the beginning, if you want. And uh, I had really great uh, sharing with people, <laughs> and uh, instead uh, I had the opposite problem coming to Germany, because back in the time, uh, the people were not really considering hacking as political, at least here at the CCC. And so my struggle was always to show 
Actually, this is also part of the root of the CCC, if you think about the work of Wow Holland. So I always refer to Wow because I think he is really a great example of how it's, how it's pos possible to bring hacking into society. Uh, and today we see actually that we have both the art and culture track and we have also the ethic, politics and society. So I think that something move on. Uh, of course, there was also the art track at the CCC back in the time, but there was less discourse about politics. And I think there should still be more, because uh, at least in my impression is that we speak a lot about that but uh, we have always to try not to just uh, confine ourselves uh, into the technological field, uh, really try to demonstrate what happens if you open these fields, if you go into culture, into art, into society, and make hacking something really concrete that is also going beyond the technology and beyond the digital itself. Um, so, then I jump in time. And I go back, uh, still, I mean, it's back in time, but it's fast forward um, to the discourse of whistleblowing. And so this is also the point why I wanted to create this connection of these dots. Uh, because, uh, I mean, this is a really great installation that the Chelsea Manning Initiative did uh, in Berlin, and they were really working a lot to support Chelsea Manning, even before when it was called Bradley Manning. And uh, I still feel also that there have not been enough talks about whistleblowing here, not really many people speaking about Chelsea Manning. And uh, I also would have wished, you know, to have more debates about that still, because back in the time in 2013, uh, 2015, this was really a big topic that we were having. So why there are not so many people now speaking about whistleblowing? And this is a, a question that I want to bring to the whole community. I think we have not to forget these people because uh, even if, you know, the discourse of Snowden was really hype back in the time, uh, Chelsea Manning is still in prison, Ola Bini was in prison, uh, Assange is in prison, many other whistleblowers are in prison. And so it's also our needs and our duty to support these people and try still to speak for an open society and also a freedom of information. So I wish that uh, at the next coming four years we will also go back to this discourse. And uh, I also want to bring something that for me was really important and was a panel that I was curating back at Trasmediale in 2014 when I was uh, curating this festival. And I want to bring it here because at the time this was a panel with Trevor Pegling, Jay Kappelbaum and Laura Poitras. We were really discussing about the impact of art and evidence and also how art uh, is informed by whistleblowing, how it's possible to use whistleblowing also as a tool to change society. And so the discourse of art as evidence was really important because also was trying to go over the, the the, the realm uh, of evidence are something very technical and to bring it into culture. I mean, it's what Laura Poitras did with her film, for example, about Snowden. So I want to refer to that, also because it was a really big inspiration for the work that I'm doing at the moment. And so, so I want to go into that now, and we start speaking about the Disruption Network Club. And in particular, what we are trying to do is also to create a, a feedback loop that is bringing together the discourse of art, politics, and disruption. And disruption is something that comes from business. We appropriate this concept, and uh, in business means to introduce in the market a product that the market doesn't expect. And uh, if you think, if you want to apply disruption into culture, into politics, and you think about hacking, then you imagine a situation in, in which you want to introduce in the closed system, something that the system doesn't expect. And this is also what is happening with whistleblowing. So there are a lot of very interesting discussion that is possible to have. And in a sense, this also goes back to art history. If you think about the unexpected that also was uh, created by the avant-garde uh, years and years ago, like to introduce the unexpected in a system that is closed, that is uh, already very much defined. And so the Disruption Network Club started in 2014. We started to really conceptualize it. 
Uh, and so the idea of disruption was very important, but also the idea of creating a network and creating a laboratory. And so the way we define it is uh, to examine the intersection of politics, technology, and society, and to expose the misconduct and the wrongdoing of the powerful. Uh, the first event that we did was uh, in uh, April 2015, and here I want to go back uh, on the discourse uh, of whistleblowing, because the, the first keynote that we have was Brandon Bryant. So I also want to remember and remind this person, because uh, you know, back in 2015 it got very popular, but we still have to remember the courageous act of many whistleblowers that were speaking back in the time and that are not so mentioned anymore, especially the drone whistleblowers, because they are really a category that has been highly persecuted. Um, and uh, Brandon was uh, a sensor operator um, and in the US Air Force. He was working there between 2006 and 2011, and uh, he was part of this uh, Predator program. And uh, when I met him, in a sense, uh, I really had the impression that I understood uh, what does it mean to change your perspective and to meet a person that before did something that you would also not agree with, but then uh, to see this person that changed opinion and try to do something very courageous. And I think, in a sense, this is also almost an artistic act, to bring the unexpected into society when you are a whistleblower, and in this case, uh, uh, this case was really to speak about drones and war, um, and how are you able to make a change, and how are you able to inspire people by creating an almost Dadaist uh, act uh, of uh, bringing something that uh, you cannot expect and turn around the situation by revealing a misconduct. Uh, so now I jump a bit, because if I'm going to tell you all the conference, <laughs> perhaps we stay here until you know, six. And uh, we did actually until now 17 conferences. Uh, and uh, um, no, 16, 16 conferences. Yeah, and uh, yes, we are, are preparing now the 17th one. And uh, I just want to mention the, this one because I think also gives, gives. What is this? Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe, I mean, we enter another realm of, uh, you know, investigation. <laughs> and uh, we are speaking about challenging supremacies. And uh, this conference was about uh, the understanding of the right-wing extremism and the idea of inviting people that are also infiltrating uh, context of right-wing extremism and at the same time also are trying to bring the unexpected inside them. So I want to mention Daryl Davis. Uh, he's a black American musician that since the 80s has been a befriended member of the Ku Klux Klan, trying to make them change opinion uh, by just having a dialogue. And I found this story very inspiring because at the end, just with the act of speaking, he was able to make a change. Okay, uh, I hope you are uh, listening to me. You, you hear well? Yes. Um, okay, so go back to Daryl Davis. <laughs> and uh, um, so I think this is also a really great example of you know, bringing into culture something that is unexpected and also bringing something that could make a change because he is also claiming that since the 18th to now, almost a 200 people from the Ku Klux Klan basically changed their opinion, and they did it by meeting a black man. Uh, then we also had a great contribute from Patrick Emerson and Julian Ebner that were infiltrating the alt-right uh, and the far-right in UK. So I also suggest you to get uh, the information from Hope Not Hate and the report that uh, Patrick Emerson did. I believe there is also a film that came out about him. Um, and so we enter now into the discourse of the current program that also Lika joined because you came with us uh, from January this year. So I'm just going briefly to introduce the first conference and then I'll leave it to you. So we are doing uh, since January a series 
that is called the art of exposing injustice. And we are working together in partnership with the Transparency International uh, and also many other realities. And as you can see from the title, uh, we uh, really want to expose the misconduct and the wrongdoing of the powerful, as this is also our title, and try to uh, you know, reflect with people how it's possible to make a social change. Um, and there is also a community program. Yeah, so my name is Lieke Plucher and I joined the Disruption Lab at the beginning of this year. Actually, we were already collaborating also since 2015, because I used to run an uh, art space in Berlin called Spectrum, where we also developed a community program. And we found that this was a really valuable, uh, valuable way to connect with people outside of the usual activities. So I joined Disruption Lab specifically to develop also a community program for the Disruption Network Lab, which we launched this year under the title Activation. So what we do in this program, um, we have now already did 16 conferences, like Tatiana just said. So we wanted to have a way of connecting with this large network that we build up, both the speakers at events, but also the people that come to our events. And there's, of course, a lot of other initiatives and realities operating in Berlin that are working in the field of our conference topics. So we felt it was really important to also find a way to share more with this crowd and also to connect more with our community rather than just doing like bigger scale conferences a couple of times in the year. So we developed this program to interact with um, our community on a more regular basis. So what we're doing now is we're doing meetups uh, each time before each conference and after each conference. And there we go into the field of the conference topic before it actually happens. And we give also Berlin communities and, and activists and other initiatives, we give them a way to present their research connected to us or give input to our program. So as an ongoing sharing with our community. So, um, yeah, going forward, we will present a bit of these uh, mm -hmm. examples of what's already happened. Now, we started six months ago, so we had a couple of meetups. But first, Tatiana will introduce the first conference that we did this year. Yeah. So, the first conference that we did this year was called Dark Heavens, Confronting Hidden Money and Power. And uh, in a sense, we were really going into the discourse of uh, exposing misconduct again. Uh, the way we define it was to explore the inner mechanism of the financial system and also the corruption of offshore companies. And of course, also you can imagine our main topic was to speak about the Panama Papers. That is another discourse that is still important to remember. That happened some time ago, also thanks to a whistleblower. Uh, and, uh, you know, the consequences of these uh, acts are still very much alive in society. And uh, we had with us many great speakers. Usually our conference format is pretty simple. It's two days in which we have one keynote and one panel. Sometimes we also like to break up our own <laughs> system and try to, you know, split up some talks, but more or less it's like that. And we really try not to make it too big, even if uh, lately we had really great participation, but not too big in terms of program to have many things happening at once, because we really want to focus on the few people that we invite, because we think uh, their act is really important, courageous, and so we have to give them enough importance also to speak with the public. So we had, for example, Frederick Obermeyer with us, um, and uh, Pelin Unker, that not so many people knew, actually was her first public talk, she told us, we didn't know this. I mean, she has been very important for the discourse of the Panama Papers because she was reporting corruption in Turkey and also facing charge for that. And so we have also to remember the important work of journalists, for example, investigative journalists that are both working with whistleblowing, whistleblowers or are trying to you know, tell the truth, and often they really suffer violent and strong form of persecution. And then we also show the film The Panama Papers from Alex Winter, and we did a really, uh, you know, deep program about the discourse of anti-corruption and also protection of uh, investigative journalists that are working on this subject. So yeah, this was the first conference of the year. It took place in, in April. 
Um, and then we also started off our community program. So around this conference in April, we organized two meetups. So this was the first one, uh, exposing secret connections. And this was also the start of the, the year that we did uh, in 2019. So this was kind of the warm up meeting to this topic of the Dark Havens conference. So what we did was we invited the local chapter of Transparency International, so Transparency Germany, and also Open Knowledge Foundation Germany, so two initiatives. From, uh, from Berlin, both of them, and Transparency Germany uh, shared with us the work that they're doing. Uh, and the interesting thing is that they, they work also, of course, a lot on financial transparency, but they organize this all in different working groups uh, composed of volunteers. So our thinking was also, it's good to hear from them what they're doing, but if people are really interested in this topic and they actually want to get involved and empowered to do something, they could also join one of these groups and understand more what's, what's going on around this topic and what they can actually work on directly themselves if they want to. Um, and the other thing was actually something really interesting which happened right around the time of our conference was the launch of the Open Company Data Registry. And this was done by Open Knowledge Foundation Germany together with uh, uh, Open Company. So they developed this database uh, where they shared Open Company data in a, a, a way that's con easy to, for people to share and find information, so sharing it as open data rather than the, the registry that's currently used in Germany. So this is a very valuable tool for journalists to actually find information if they're researching about corruption. Um, so it was really interesting to hear from them uh, how they developed this and why they developed this and also how people can actually use this tool. So this was kind of the, the warm up we did to the, to the conference. Um, then we had the actual conference and then we followed up with a meeting afterwards. So to kind of reflect on what happened at the conference, continue some of the discussions. And we also invited one of the speakers at the conference, which was Friedrich Lindenberg from OCCRP Data. And he came uh, to the, to the meetup to share a bit more in depth what this tool actually is. Also how people can use it, how people could help in improving the tool because it's not completely ready and there's a lot of things they would like to add on to it. So this was a really interesting way also for people to sort of dive deeper into the topic. And we had a sharing of one of the workshops we organized um, in connection to the conference. So this was organized by the art collective ryBN.org and it's called Offshore Tour Operator. So this is a really great workshop. Actually, if you're interested in this topic and you want to find out more about the Panama Papers and the traces of offshore corruption in daily life, it's really uh, recommended to go to their website. They have also an app and you can, you can see everything online. They're sharing everything openly. Um, you can basically find all the addresses that are in the database um, in OpenStreetMap. So you can go exploring and finding like traces of this offshore banking in the, in the daily landscape. So in the workshop we did this with a, a special GPS device on our back. And these are some of the photos that actually Tatjana and Jonas <laughs> discovered in the, in the rich west of Berlin. So obviously a lot of uh, traces of corruption down there. And uh, yeah, as you can see on the map, sometimes it's a lot of walking around to try to find the places. But yeah, the workshop obviously was only limited to a certain amount of people that could join, which we thought was a pity because there was many people interested that couldn't join. So we decided to have this extra moment at the community meetup to share what had been going on so that more people could understand this and also maybe do the workshop themselves or explore Berlin, which actually is a way to make you very paranoid. So I don't know if it's always nice, but <laughs> it's important to know a bit more about that. Yeah, and then we moved to the next conference. This was this year in June. So this was the most recent conference we did. And it was called AI Traps, Automating Discrimination. And in this event, we were re reflecting on how AI and algorithms can reinforce the prejudice and the bias that's already in the current society and how this has a, an impact and increases discrimination, especially for groups that are already minorities. So there's discrimination based on race, gender, for example. And this is actually quite a big problem, especially since AI is, is growing and growing and having a bigger impact in our society. So um, we hosted different panels. This was the final panel of the conference and it was about the politics of AI. So it was especially connecting this problem of AI to the wider political systems of our society. So. The speakers there were uh, Dia Kayali, uh, Oskiz, and Dan McQuillan. 
And they were also discussing how just changing AI is not enough. We need to actually go beyond and look at where this is coming from, that AI is prejudiced. And maybe we should even change societies because there's a lot of negative influence. And we need to be more aware of the context in which these AIs operate. And here we see on the slide uh, um, a slide about the gender discrimination that's often reinforced by AI, especially because of the increased facial recognition technologies. So also, um, yeah, we had quite a lot of transgender speakers in this conference because it's yeah, a topic affecting this community especially a lot. Um, yeah, we also spoke about racial... Uh, yeah, also yeah. racial discrimination, yeah. And all the talks are online on our website, so if you want to catch up on anything, you can find all the videos there. Um, yeah, and because of this, this uh, transgender queer connection, we also decided to warm up this topic by doing a meetup around this. So um, this we did in May, so the month before the conference, we invited a community from Berlin called the Xeno Entities Network. And they're a very interesting community because they're connecting the discourse of queer and feminist and gender studies with digital technology. And they often host what they call uh, open conversations. So they organized a night um, around AI threats on queer bodies, so especially about the impact that this AI and surveillance and control mechanism have on the, the queer and trans community. So we had a night here uh, at the space where we're hosting our meetups, which is called State Studio in Berlin. So it's an art science gallery. And yeah, we were all sitting around watching different uh, fragments on the topic and then discussing together, like, um, what are the counter mechanisms and what can artists and activists do to, to counteract these forms of increased surveillance and control. Um, then we had the conference and then the second meetup afterwards, mm -hmm. which we wanted to focus also on um, yeah, some positive examples of what actually people have been doing against this or some first starts of what can be done against this AI bias problem. So we invited two projects again uh, based in Berlin. So there was the Open Shufa project run by Open Knowledge Germany and Algorithm Watch and the Oracle for Trans Feminist Technologies, which is uh, developed by Coding Rights. And yeah, it was a really nice meetup also because um, at the end of it, we got this great image shared from, uh, <laughs> through Twitter from one of the participants that felt really inspired by the whole yeah. event and just decided to sketch what, uh, what has been going on. So yeah, the Open Shufa project, for those that don't know it, I would really check it out. It's very interesting. It was a project that ran in 2018. And for those of you who are German, you probably know the Shufa is a credit scoring company. So if you're in Germany and you want to rent a house, you usually have to provide a paper from the Shufa private company that will tell you what your score is and if you're actually allowed to rent this house, like if you have enough credit rate. And yeah, the strange thing is that this is calculated by an intransparent algorithm. So the Shufa is a private company and people are not really sure how the score is calculated. So Open Knowledge Foundation Germany and Algorithm Watch organized a campaign where people could donate their Shufa data and they were trying to reverse engineer this algorithm to find out what exactly was going on. So by inviting them and sharing this more widely, we wanted people to give a better understanding of what's been going on and also for them maybe to join this kind of projects in the future or donate their data or yeah, get involved with such initiatives and share the great work that has been done already. Then I'll hand yeah. over again. So, and the next conference that we are preparing, uh, and so you, you are all invited, <laughs> is called Citizens of Evidence. And so we are reconnecting with this discussion about whistleblowing, but we are also trying to reflect on how to extend the concept of whistleblowing to the civil society. So how can people uh, enable the fact uh, to um, expose misconducts and uh, how they can either do it by themselves or in collaboration with journalists uh, or with researchers and activists and also, you know, activists themselves. And the um, citizens of evidence also, as you say, recon uh, as I say, con reconnect with this discourse of uh, imagining uh, um, how we could transfer whistleblowing into society and culture. And uh, what we are preparing at the moment uh, is the whole program that will involve a very uh, great speaker. For example, we have Matthew Caruana Galizia, uh, that is the son of Daphne Caruana Galizia, uh, the journalist that has been assassinated in Malta uh, to expose misconducts and corruption 
uh, analyzing also uh, and in relation to the material of the Panama Papers, so we create there a connection. But at the same time, we have also uh, people that are more grassroots oriented uh, and are really analyzing other forms of movements. For example, the other keynotes we will have is uh, Wuming One from the Wuming Collective, an Italian great collective of writers that back in the time under the name of Luther Blissett wrote the book Q that has been also translated into German. I really suggest you to read. And he will speak about the movement of the Val di Susa, that is a really special uh, and interesting case uh, of people that are fighting the construction of the high-speed uh, train to connect uh, the city of Turin and uh, the city of Lyon in France. And so this is, uh, I think, is a very important uh, argument and discussion uh, platform as well to understand also how a movement was successful because thanks to their activity that is going back to 25 years and even more, the train was actually never really able to go into existence uh, uh, and also all the corruption speculation that uh, was uh, around all this plan and also the, the crazy and really bad uh, uh, impact on the climate and the territory. Um, so, I mean, uh, now I'm go not going to tell you all the details of the conference, but of course you can watch, look it online and uh, also come, that is nice. And uh, I leave then to you the description of the workshop. Yeah, so we're organizing two things like additional to the conference, so a community meetup, which I'll present in a second, but also a workshop on the final day, so on the Sunday after the conference. And this is called Flying in Berlin Sky, an afternoon investigation, which is a really uh, going to be a very exciting workshop because there's an investigative journalist, Emmanuel Freudenthal, and uh, a hacker called Sector035. And together they will uh, take, the, take us uh, to the Tempelhofer Feld, which is a big airspace in Berlin, to do some uh, research of what's going on in the sky. So they're working on plane tracking. Uh, there are actually Emmanuel's behind the Dictator Alert Project, which is a great uh, initiative trying to figure out how dictators are moving around the world through the sky. So yeah, we hope to find out some interesting things by going to Berlin, uh, Tempelhofer Feld, and putting up some antennas, catching what's going on in the air, and then analyzing this uh, later. So a good example of some open source intelligence work that we can do directly ourselves after the event. And we will go to supermarket as well. Yes, yeah. we will end the day at supermarket, which is also a great uh, art space in Berlin to finalize our analysis and investigation. So yeah, we're really looking forward to that. And Emmanuel will also be a speaker at the conference, but also hold this workshop. And yeah, to warm up for all of this in, uh, in September, so on the 4th of September, for those of you in Berlin or wanting to visit Berlin, you're really welcome to join us because we will do uh, um, a preparatory meetup, actually more a workshop on how to set up a secure self-hosted file distribution system. And we're organizing this together with the great conference Radical Networks, which was held last year in Berlin. This year it will be in New York. And this is a conference around network technology and how to use this also as an artistic medium, but also an event that celebrates the free and open internet. So something very closely related also to our work. And we felt it's very important also to organize this meetup as a, a real hands-on workshop for people to understand how they can set up their own self-hosted installation of Nextcloud, so an open source alternative to Google Drive, and also how to set up um, their own Wi-Fi servers on Raspberry Pi. So yeah, we'll try to do that all in three hours, so that will be a challenge, but uh, <laughs> you're really welcome to join us and, uh, and participate. So, um, and also, if you want to know more about the conference after this talk, we have a lot of flyers here you can pick up the Speakers program. Stickers as well. That Stickers, wanted. everything. <laughs> and yeah, the workshop will be hosted by Sarah Grant and Danja Vasiliev, who are both part of the Radical Networks and also the Weisse Sieben studio in Berlin. So yeah, hopefully it will look like this with a lot of people <laughs> joining and, and yeah, getting involved see. and learning. And yeah, and I uh, just to I also want to bring a little conclusion. Uh, I mean, actually, I want to say two things. One is, uh, I mean, nice to finish this talk, also showing this great uh, uh, video, you know, 
installation that was done by the Chelsea Manning Initiative mm -hmm. when we were doing our conference stand, in which we also invited Mustafa Bassam of Lalsec. This is also another great name that I like to yeah. mention, part of our program. Um, and, uh, you know, keep fighting is a very uh, important concept for us. And uh, I want to conclude again with a little reflection of, I mean, I know that for a lot of hackers to speak about culture only and related to whistleblowing might sound very boring, like, oh, no, I want to put my hands on on things. Uh, culture sounds very theoretical and boring. Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, because we really like to connect dots, we have not to forget that at the moment what we are witnessing in politics and society and maybe is also going to influence the technology of the future that we will have is a sort of uh, info war because we are really witnesses the emergency of a lot of right-wing extremist movements and so we still believe that to work on culture is very, very important, especially also for the people that work with technology and are able to shape the society that will also come in the future. So I think that we have to work together, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> there cannot be only you know, people coding without people working on culture. We have to stress up this aspect. Probably, hopefully, next time we will have an audience uh, formed by uh, 100,000 people yes. <laughs> and they won't be scared by the word culture. Uh, and uh, then I want to conclude also to thank our great team that we didn't mention. Yes. Uh, that uh, we have a team of really great people, uh, Jonas Franchi and also Nada Becker, Monty, uh, Giacomo Marinsalta, and some of them are also here at the camp. Uh, so I really feel to thank all of you, and uh, I think we are done. Yeah. And we can uh, open for questions. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot to our lovely speakers. Are there any questions you know, from the audience about this talk? Anybody? <laughs> Is there a question from the internet? No. No questions? Then I would Everybody like to finish... Everybody in the lake. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we also go there. Yeah, the lake is the place to be too. Let's finish with the last round of applause and... Thank you. And thank you all for coming.